Good evening, everyone. Welcome. I hope you all can hear me. Maybe a hand raise or a nod. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, a warm welcome. Greetings of peace. What we say, Om Shanti, to all of you. I see we have an international family get together here. We have the London family, we have the Hong Kong family, and we also have the Suriname family. It is wonderful. And I would like to also welcome Brother Charlie. Welcome, Brother. Thank you so much for giving us time today. A little bit about Brother Charlie. He has been the national coordinator of Australia. We have about 40 in Australia and he has also the experience of more than 40 years in knowledge. He talks in uh, for seminars, conferences, workshops on various topics and today we have Brother Charlie sharing on how to create healthy relationships. Before I hand over to Brother Charlie, I would like to say, um, in case we get cut off, do rejoin on the same link. I have also posted the link we are on YouTube Live, so just in case, before you cut, get cut off, in case, sometimes the internet is not very helpful. So kindly just copy paste the link that I've posted on the chat section. If you just click where the chat is, there is a link there that I have posted. So just in case you get cut off and are not able to join into Zoom the same account again, you can watch through YouTube. Or in case if you would like to replay it also and take down some notes, that will be the link. Also, please feel free to ask questions. Drop your questions at the chat box. And before we end the session, we will ask Brother Charlie to answer them. Thank you so much. Brother Charlie, over to you now. Well, thank you so much, Jabeen. It's so lovely to be with you. And um, it's a wonderful new world we're living in that you in your home in Jakarta, me in my home in Sydney, and others all over the world, we can meet together. And I really do deeply appreciate that um, during this very challenging time in which we're living at the moment, that Jabeen is offering us <clears throat> support to help us work with what is going on at the moment and perhaps learn more about ourselves. And I don't know about all of you, but I found that all over the world, a lot of us are turning to spirituality, taking time out to learn more about myself so that I can support myself and my family during this time. As Jabeen was saying, I would love to just share some of my thoughts and very happy to answer a few questions. <clears throat> you know, my experience is no matter where you go in this world, if you ask people what is the most important thing in their lives, virtually all people will say, my family, my relationships. My experience is that if the family is good, relationships are good, <clears throat> no matter how challenging this time of the virus, the economic downturn is, we can manage because we have the nutrients of love, belonging and care in our lives. But often I ask the question, you know, what's given you the most happiness in life? And I think majority, if not all people, say family relationships. Next question, what's given you the most sorrow in life? Is it the same answer? <laughs> I think we all know how <clears throat> relationships have both sides of the coin. And yet my experience, and I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a counselor, but I've been teaching meditation for many, many years. <clears throat> and that means that I listen to a lot of people. 
I think relationships are becoming harder and harder for most people. And for the first time in human history, we are watching the breakdown of the family. In many countries, less than 50% of people live in a traditional family, which is like the support unit from my heart, that unit that gives me belonging and care and love. Not only that, that we're living in a time where there's many mental health issues. Now, they've always been there, but I think more and more, and there's many reasons for that. But I would say from a spiritual perspective, the main reason for mental health issues is a lack of true love in this life or a lack of true love in a past life. Not only is there the family breakdown or mental health challenges at the moment, the paradox is we live in these huge cities with millions and millions of people. But how many of us feel lonely? We don't feel connected really in a true sense to others. And I have a, a close friend who's a management consultant. And he works for a lot of the Fortune 500 companies. And you know, he often has said to me that the biggest cost to industry worldwide is conflict. There's so much conflict in our world. And if I look at what has really, what's the most important thing in my life, I would say the experience of love. And I'm sure all of you are the same. And my experience is when the heart feels nurtured with that true quality of love, I notice I feel very relaxed. You notice that you feel very easy about yourself. You feel calm and definitely more generous and compassionate towards those around us. For me, in life, the most powerful thing is a loving heart. My observation, a loving heart breaks down barriers between people. A loving heart fills empty hearts. A loving heart heals hearts in pain. And as we all know, a loving heart can touch places in people when they're in a really down state, they've lost hope. A loving heart can work magic. But on the other side of the coin, if the heart lacks love, the mind can never rest. You know, the agitated mind, something is missing. It's always searching and seeking. I honestly feel a lot of us yearn for a quality of peace, but we only find it when I feel deeply secure. When I feel loved, I feel, ah, I'm home. This is where I belong. I feel comfortable. But, you know, the first need in life is love. The first desire is love. And if that desire isn't fulfilled, my observation is that millions of desires emerge. The desire for material things, the desire for power, the desire for control, the desire for respect. All these desires often emerge when the first desire, the first need in life, which is to be experienced quality love, hasn't really been felt. And I, if I was to ask all of you, um, you know, what are the signs of healthy relationships? We all know, actually, all of us on this webinar, we're all experts in relationships. We've had a lifetime. And we would all say, I think, that the signs of healthy relationships are when we're loving, we give regard, we're kind, we're forgiving, we're generous, we're honest. There's a whole long shopping list of things. But what are the signs of unhealthy relationships? We all know those too. You know, to be controlling. You know that, that control, often from the mind, that you have to behave in the way I want. That abusive nature, and that abuse may not be even verbal, but it can be very subtle in many ways. Manipulation, um, dishonesty, disrespect, criticism. <clears throat> There's a whole shopping list of unhealthy signs of relationships too. But because this is a spiritual webinar, what I'm really interested in 
is spirituality is all about learning about me. So what are the signs in me that contribute to unhealthy relationships? How can I know when I'm actually contributing to relationships that make them difficult? And I would say a few of the attitudes. When I always feel you are the problem. When I find myself constantly blaming others for how I feel. When I have unrealistic expectations. And often we have these very, very unrealistic expectations of how others should be. And I've noticed that those people who have unrealistic expectations are permanently disappointed. No one can live up to their expectations. And other signs of unhealthy relationships, I'm often feeling irritated, annoyed, frustrated. I hold grudges, I can't forgive. And so in spirituality, if I observe some of these in my, myself, what spirituality really teaches us is to take responsibility for myself. And that is really like, if I want healthier relationships, what am I going to do? Because often we have a syndrome of, you know, banging my head, if I can say this against a brick wall, you should change, what's wrong with you? You should change. <laughs> and, you know, do people change? Do people change if we tell them, I don't think so. <laughs> And so one thing that really helped me early in my spiritual journey was someone asked me a simple question. They said, what do you have control over? And they said, do you have control over your partner? No. Children? No. Your parents? No. Your boss? No, we don't. So what do I have control over? Actually, my sphere of influence is my thoughts, my feelings, my reactions. This is where I have influence. I can't control you, but where I have influence, I can control my reactions to you. And this is where spirituality begins, that I begin to see that some relationships are difficult. They're challenging. We all have them. But if I keep saying you, 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 they get worse. But if I start to see where I can shift, where I can move, where I can change, then I'm starting to open the door to creating healthy relationships. And, you know, I once read, I actually studied Greek history at school. I'm not even sure why I did. But, and Sophocles once said something like, Wisdom is the supreme art of happiness. I really love that, that the ultimate wisdom in life is to be happy. And what is sorrow? Is that the ultimate ignorance in life? And you know the way I feel that if I'm experiencing sorrow in my relationships, I would say it's a sign from life that I lack wisdom somewhere. It's a little message from life that if my relationships aren't good, if they're not working, it's a little message that I have to learn more, that I need some new wisdom. So where do we begin? <clears throat> and there's probably three wisdoms that all of us need for a quality life. And I would say that the first wisdom, as we know, is my intellectual ability, my IQ. And this is the wisdom we all develop in life. We go to university, we develop a career, we make money, we do this, we do that. But if you're experiencing conflict, if you're experiencing difference, if you're experiencing depression, does this wisdom help? I don't think so. So on one hand, we're so educated intellectually, but on the other hand, sometimes we're so uneducated about myself and really what's happening inside. The second wisdom we need for life is emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence is just simply to me the wisdom to build rich 
loving relationships with others. Not learnt in the classroom, and often the, the, the people who have the best emotional intelligence in my observation are mothers. Mothers have an incredible ability to sort of tune into people and see where they're at and know how to respond. But once again, you know, even if there is a, a deep conflict, sometimes it helps, but sometimes I'm still not sure what to do. The third type of wisdom is spiritual intelligence. And I would say that if emotional intelligence is the wisdom to build rich, loving relationships with others, spiritual intelligence is the wisdom to build a rich, loving relationship with me. The first relationship in life is with me. And if that is unhealthy, it pollutes my health, my relationships with others, my performance in the workplace. And you know, to be honest, my feeling is that look at our world out there, look at the world we're living in, it is so dysfunctional. The main reason that this first relationship in life in 7.5 billion human beings is so unhealthy. It is, this relationship is so dysfunctional and it's polluting the entire environment of our world. And <clears throat> this is why, you know, I would say that if I really want to create healthy relationships, and we all do, it's, a, it's the most natural part of life, there's two steps, even before I start to think about others. And the first step is to ask my heart a question. Am I having a healthy relationship with myself? Ask your heart absolutely honestly, how do I talk to myself? You know that little person inside your head? The self-talk. You know, am I loving? Am I kind? Am I respectful? Am I forgiving when I make a mistake? Am I gentle? Or do I talk down to myself? Am I abusive? Do I talk? That self-talk, you're hopeless, people don't love you. You know this very negative self-talk. Because quite honestly, spirituality says until this relationship heals, <clears throat> really we're not going to get to first base with our family and friends. And this is what I love about spirituality. I take responsibility and I need to learn about myself. So the big question, who am I and what sort of relationship do I have with me, first of all? Because this is the platform, the springboard to have quality relationships with family, friends and more. And when I look inside, <clears throat> there's three personalities inside of me. And I would say two of them are quite unhealthy in relationships and one of them helps me rebuild a healthy relationship. The first I call the eye of arrogance or the eye of superiority. And this personality takes its whole sense of identity from the labels of my body. You know, that's how I see myself. And when this personality rules my inner system, I have a whole thinking, feeling, behavioral structure. I compare with others. I think I am better. I know more. I am right. You know that ego thinks the way I think is right. You know? But when it comes into my feelings, when my ego is ruling my inner system, I feel so easily insulted disrespected, not valued, excluded, sensitive. And look at all those emotions. How destructive are they in relationships? You know, a little word my ego takes, I feel insulted. I say things back. And so really I would say a major cause of unhealthy relationships is my ego. There's no doubt others have ego too. 
But the second eye is what I call <clears throat> the inverted ego, the eye of inferiority, the eye of lack of self-respect. Personally, I feel this eye rules our world at the moment. And this eye takes its whole sense of identity from my body. This is, you know, on all the labels of my body. <clears throat> Mahatma Gandhi once said, labels are for jars, they're not for people. We often put them on people. And this eye has this whole thinking, feeling, behavioral structure. I compare and I think others are better, others know more, others don't love me, others don't value me, others don't respect me. When it comes into my feelings, when I'm under the influence of my lack of self-esteem, I feel hopeless, I feel inadequate, I feel unworthy, and I would say depressed. In psychology, depression is a sadness that my dream in life to be loved and valued hasn't happened. But in spirituality, depression is like a mourning for the loss of my true identity. And so when <clears throat> my lack of self-respect is strong, it's like I'm wearing glasses that, that put a filter on life. And I feel people talk down to me. People don't respect me. No one respects me. But actually, it's me not respecting myself. My lack of self-respect is deceiving me. And when my mind, my heart is ruled by my ego and lack of self-respect, up, down, you know, massive mood swings. Spirituality says develop a relationship with the original I. Who am I? And this is the deep research of a spiritual person. <clears throat> we all know I'm a soul. The soul is a wonder. It's just a point. In mathematics, a point exists, but it has no length, breadth, or width. The soul is incredibly subtle. And it sits actually in the front of the brain around the pituitary gland. I am the soul. I'm not even male or female, let alone a religion or a culture. That is all just the labels of the temporary self. <clears throat> and actually, when I start to have a relationship with myself as a soul, I rebuild this first relationship. I begin to heal this first relationship in life. My experience is it's like coming home to a place where you really belong inside. And you take the pressure off yourself to look good, to impress people. You begin to accept yourself as you are. And really the first step in healthy relationships is to rebuild the relationship with me. This is the first step of spirituality. The second step I would say is experiencing true love, a quality of love. And there's three sources of love in life, myself, God, and my family and friends. For most of us, the relationship with me is not that healthy. Unfortunately, as we we're saying, we talk down we, to ourselves, etc. The relationship with God, we may have faith in God, but I'm not sure we really taste a real sense of love and genuine belonging. So my one source of love is my family and friends. And so if there's a loss, a death in the family, if there's a separation or a conflict or a falling out, my whole life goes into chaos. What is spirituality? As I was saying, the first step is to build a loving relationship with myself as the eternal soul. And secondly, a loving relationship with God. And I began my meditation journey well, 45 years ago now. And I was wandering, traveling the world at the time. And I lived in all sorts of religious communities. And I settled in London. I was living in London. 
And I was really wanting to learn how to change my thinking. And I began to learn meditation with the Brahma Kumaris. And I made a lot of sense. Who am I? I am the eternal soul. They offered me an idea about God. If God is a soul like me, a point, that I'm a soul that's taken birth and rebirth, I'm reaping the fruits of my actions. I know happiness. I know sorrow. God is a soul that's eternally beyond that game. God is eternally clean and unadulterated, but a real soul, not just a belief, not just a concept. Because sometimes when we meditate, we're sort of meditating on a belief or an intellectual idea. We're meditating on a living soul, like a lover of the soul, a parent of the soul. And actually, <clears throat> when I learn to connect my mind with this soul, is an unlimited source of love. And this is the only permanent relationship in life. You know why, you know, we invest our heart in relationships. We give everything. You think, how much have you given to your families? You give so much. But there's a huge human dilemma. No relationship is permanent whether it's time, whether it's change, whether it's conflict, whether it's death. And so the source of my love dries up and we feel so insecure. But in spirituality, the relationship with God is always there. And if I actually learn how to connect my mind, and you know, what I've learned, it's like God, the supreme soul, a real living conscious being. Is on the FM wavelength. When I'm, you know, bodily conscious, when I'm not aware of who I am, it's like I'm on the AM wavelength. I can believe in God, but I can't connect because I can't tune into the FM dial. When I actually become soul conscious, I go up to the FM wavelength and the reality of this connection and relationship becomes so real. This relationship has absolutely changed me as a person. It's unbelievable how I've transformed over the years. And I would say the main way is my sense of self-value has been strengthened, strengthened, grown and grown to the point that as life changes around us, look at the world now, I feel quite stable internally because I know who I am, I experience who I am and I have this this friend, this lover with me as I go about my life. And my experience is that when we hold this platform inside, the connection with myself and the connection with God, I've got this incredibly stable platform to build healthy relationships with my family and friends. I've got an inner strength to come from. Today, most of us are empty. So I want you to fill my emptiness. Sometimes I think our minds are like a vacuum cleaner, you know. <laughs> I need love, I need respect. I need your love, I need your respect, you know. But when you insult me, when you criticize me, I take in everything and then I blame you. <laughs> We're so needy, We're so vulnerable. And then we keep blaming you and actually it's my sensitivity and it's not that I'm different from everybody. We are all much the same these days. We all come from this place of neediness and vulnerability. And so to rebuild healthy relationships, there's so many things, but just a few to share tonight. I think once this awareness of who I am and practice, not just belief, We've all grown up, we all know this stuff. Whether you're a Hindu background, a Christian background, we all know we're a soul or a spirit. And we even have some faith in God. But Raj Yoga is about practicing and experiencing. And when I begin to experience who I am, experience this connection, I then begin to come into relationship with others. The first law of spirituality says, 
in the first step to healthy relationships, I am responsible for how I feel. I am responsible for how I feel. <clears throat> people will be rude. People will be difficult. People will have moods. But I have a choice. Do I absorb it or do I not absorb it? Most of us absorb it. And then, as I was saying, we then play the game of blame. And in spirituality, we would say the ultimate ignorance is to blame. The ultimate, when I know I'm under the influence of falsehood, when I'm totally under the influence of self-deception is when my mind is always projecting onto others. Because if we look underneath it, what are we saying? When you change, my life will get better. Will other people change? Will other people change? I don't think so. And so what happens? We feel a victim. Only victims blame. And I absolutely feel I position myself as a victim. I'm convinced I'm a victim. And in saying that, I know sometimes there's some really, really challenging family situations. There are. And yet, if I really have the truth of who I am and God, this connection with God, I will never feel a victim, even in challenging situations. So first, I think I have to take responsibility for how I feel. And secondly, my experience and what I've learned from the Brahma Kumaris is that for healthy relationships hold the value of others in my attitude. You know, at the heart of relationships is communication. What is relationships? It's, it's connecting. And when you connect, there's three things happening. You say something. There's your face, you know, and your vibrations. Your face and your vibrations, the nonverbal part, in fact, research shows us has 80 to 90% influence in any relationship. And so when I'm connecting others, with, when you are with others and you get two messages, one is what you hear and one is what you feel, what do you trust? You will always trust your feelings, always. So actually 90% of relationship is really the quality of your thinking. People feel it. And sometimes people think my mind is private. Your mind is not private. People feel the energy of your mind. <clears throat> Some people wonder why people don't love me, why people don't come close to me. It's very simple. When I hold critical feelings, or when you come in front of me and I'm remembering what you said or did last week, so I'm saying, oh, lovely to see you. And in my mind, I'm thinking, last week you said this to me. <laughs> we all know what happens, right? People feel your vibrations. And this is my experience that when you meditate, <clears throat> it's like you're connecting. If you connect to the past, if you connect to difficult relationships, low vibration in your mind. If you connect to God, very high vibration, and you spread that perfume in the atmosphere, people will love you. People will want to come close to you. It is that simple. <clears throat> if I'm creating critical negative thinking, people won't come close to me. And so I would really suggest... And if I really want to improve relationships, observe my attitude. There's three steps. There's awareness, attitude, atmosphere. I call them the three A's. When you're aware of yourself and God, your attitude propels that vibration and creates a sweet atmosphere. All of you know there's some people you meet that you really love to be with. There's a feeling about them that makes you feel comfortable, makes you feel secure. You can be who you want to be. Sometimes we're around some people we feel uncomfortable. I feel I have to suppress my true personality because there's some vibration of expectation. The third thing I would say that really helps healthy relationships 
is to be humble. And I would say as much as I'm humble, others will respect me. As much as I'm humble, I will be loving and others will love me. And quite honestly, as much as I'm humble, life becomes easy. There is a huge relationship between love and ego. And fundamentally, it is the more ego, the less lovable I am. You think, you know, often when the people are old, really old, they're very lovable, right? Or little children are very lovable because they have less ego. And in a way, the spiritual journey is learning about my ego, learning how it deceives me and dismantling an ego I've created. <clears throat> the more I do, the more love comes into my life. What is the role of ego? Ego makes me feel separate. Ego makes me feel separate. When I have a lot of ego, I always feel different. I don't feel I belong. And in my head, it's a reality. And yet, it's a construct because of my own body consciousness, my own ego is deceiving me at that time. And you know, the more I practice to be a soul, the more I move into self-respect and I let go ego. Honestly, that self-respect, the expression of self-respect is humility. Someone who has good self-respect will be humble. The fourth thing I feel is to accept difference, allow people to be different. Some people say, I love you, I love you, I love you, but you have to behave in the way I like. Is that love? I would say true love is really allowing people to be who they are, really giving them a heart to really be who they want to be as a person. And you know, my big learning in life is that no matter how close you are to people, everyone interprets life very differently. Have you noticed that? <laughs> you know, I live in Sydney, but my, my brother and his wife live in Melbourne. And they have a big circle of friends, and they often go to dinner parties. And on the way home, my sister-in-law likes to often talk about what happened at the dinner party. <laughs> And my brother always had a completely different perception. And my sister-in-law, she often used to say, Richard is my brother's name. Richard, did we go to the same dinner party? Because <laughs> he was reading it completely different. They have a very good relationship. They're very close. And we forget that there's a thing we call in communication called the injection myth. Often when we talk to somebody, we have an idea in my head, I speak it, and I imagine it just, it's like an email, I click the send button, and it goes and sits in your mind, and you understand it like me. I'm afraid that never, ever happens. Because you interpret that according to your mood, according to your life experience, according to your culture, according to your values, according to a, you will that message, you'll distort that message. And that's why sometimes, you know, when you say something to a family member, you think so normal, and they react, they don't like it. And you think, what? It just seems so normal to me. Because we forget that every message people will distort to a certain extent. And this is why the more you give love, the more you give respect, the more you give belonging, the feelings make help people stay close, even if they don't accept the message you're giving them. And you know, in organizations, they often talk about the four stages of groups. You know, and it's a little bit like families in a sense too. There's forming, storming, norming, and performing. And when we come together with friends, we meet people. 
that's forming. And it's a bit superficial because we don't know each other well. The second step is storming. Differences will emerge. It's absolutely normal. People are different. It's absolutely normal. But today people feel threatened by difference. And you know the thing that moves people from storming to norming is accepting difference. Allow people. They may have a different worldview because of their culture. Or they may have a different understanding because of their religion or perception of things. And if I am in self-respect, I can accept. But if I lack self-respect, I feel threatened by difference. And look at our world. People feel so threatened by all the different perceptions in our world. It's a lack of self-respect. The, the fifth thing I would say in healthy relationships is have an attitude of giving. The law of life says if you want love, give it. If you want respect, give it. If you want cooperation, give it. What is the karmic law of life? As you give, so you receive. A lot of, some people wait around for you to love me and you to respect me. Unfortunately, those people wait all their life. My observation, the happiest people are the givers. Always giving. I think many of you know Daddy Jenki, um, who is, was the head of the Brahma Kalamaris, who just died a month ago. You know, I knew her for 45 years. I've traveled extensively with her. She was amazing. She had such a love for God, you can't believe. And, it, <clears throat> and her whole 24 hours a day, seven days a week, was giving, 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 giving. It's a beautiful life. And you know, the more you give, the less you take sorrow, take disrespect, etc. The next thing for healthy relationships, I would say, is let go, let go, and let go more. <laughs> and what I mean by that is things happen, people do things which aren't good. But I've seen that if we can't forgive, we hold on to things all my life. Who suffers? I suffer. I'm, I punish myself. And a wise person will forgive and move on. But some people feel, well, if I forgive, it's like saying to somebody, what you did was okay. And I don't think it was okay. Personally, I feel it's possible to say, I don't agree with what happened. It's not my values. It's not my principles. But for my peace, I'm going to let it go and move on. The greatest act of spirituality is to forgive, let go and move on. It's like you bring peace into your life, you, back into your life once again, when you're able to do that. And just finally, and maybe if there's any questions, <clears throat> maybe Jadine, if you are reading anything in the chat box, if anyone wants to ask, <laughs> maybe you can ask on their behalf. But, you know, what I've really learned a lot is that I'm a soul. And we know it, we believe it. The more I research that and practice, your, the sacred space of your mind becomes so calm and peaceful. And you begin to, when you meet others, you see them beyond their limited identity. You see them as a soul. And you know when you see a person as a body, <clears throat> you position yourself as superior or inferior. You know, we compare when you see the soul, it's like a vision of equality, a vision of respect. It's a beautiful vision. And if you practice that, even in your family tonight, you know, just see them as souls. And actually, your sense of love and respect increases when you do. So I'm looking at the time. <clears throat> I've been talking for quite a bit of time. <laughs> We only have a few minutes, but 
If anyone would like all to be in, maybe if anyone has asked any questions, I'd be happy to respond. Yeah. Um, I don't have any questions here so far, but I'm hoping somebody does ask. In the meantime, I would like to thank you. It's been wonderful what you shared. It's indeed an eye opener. Sometimes we have a conflict within ourselves. And today I think you really made it very clear of how do we resolve this inner conflict, like you said, the inner dialogue that we have within ourselves. I do have a question from a friend of mine who is not able to join today. She is a wonderful mother and she has been giving altruistically like all mothers do to their children. But apparently now she's been having some problems with them and they are telling her to take professional help as in to go for counseling. So she's, she is in a turmoil as in what to do. You know, um, Devine, that's a, a very fascinating question. And, you know, I'll tell you the experience. When I started in Australia, when I came back from London, I was living in Melbourne. And there was a mother coming to the centre and she had four children. And she was having a few problems with some of them. They were adult children. And, you know... She said, I decided to become more detached, meaning very loving, very caring, very close, but not so needy and influenced. And you know what she said? Before I became detached, they never really asked my opinions. But after I became more detached, they started to respect me a lot more. You know, sometimes we become so attached that attachment creates sort of love-hate relationships, if I can say. You love them because they're giving you support, but you feel controlled or confined. You don't feel a sense of freedom. And I feel that really a healthy relationship is to be detached because when you're detached, you can love someone in a good mood you can also love them in a bad mood. When you're attached, you're so affected. But when you go home and everyone's good, you're good. But if one of them's rude or angry, we're absolutely shocked and I just drink it all in. And a lot of us feel that's normal. That's how life is. But actually, really, I would say one of the main things I've learned and I've observed many mothers and family people Learn to be less influenced. And that doesn't mean you're cutting yourself off, you're becoming aloof. No, that's not accurate detachment. It's actually the more you feel close to God, you step into your own power. And so when they're rude to you or they're disrespectful to you, you don't take it so personally. You don't, you're not so affected. And the paradox is the more detached you become, the more people love and respect you more attached, they will misuse you, they will look down at you and often disrespect you. And I would say one of the, I was talking mainly about ego today. Attachment is, has a devastating effect on quality relationships. And we often think, well, isn't that what relationships are? Just dependent. No, you can actually be so close and yet not so dependent. And that's a freedom it's almost like when you become so conscious, you renegotiate how to have relationships with others. And you feel, I find, even closer and less influenced. So it's not easy. These things aren't easy. But I feel because we become so dependent on those family members around us, if things change, it's like we're devastated. And I'm afraid so many people are so devastated in their life because they're so needy. But when you take from God, you step back into your own power and you're not as needy and actually then it improves the relationships. Thank you, brother. 
Um, let me just check if there was any. Someone saying, yes. saying, if children are rude, just take it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, is, the thing yes. is, to say it's you, 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 you. But often that's a result of my own dependence. And if they chronically rude, what are you going to do? You're going to just be rude back to them all the time. And what does that do? It just makes both of you unhappy with each other. I would look at yourself and begin to change yourself, learn about yourself, and I will guarantee it will be slow in time. They will change their attitude towards you. They really will. And if try an experiment, Renu, try an experiment to, you know, really be... Um, practice soul consciousness, practice the connection with the Supreme, and just observe the effect on your relationships with your children. We have some questions here. I'll read it out. Om Shanti, Charlie Bhai, you mentioned about giving and giving more. But we often hear, I gave and gave, and after some time, I had nothing more to give. What is your advice or guidance on this? good question because you know when I give from myself I get become empty when I'm taking from God and really you know I was talking about Daddy Jenki before she died at 104 years old I saw her when 102 103 she would just give from the morning through to the night what happens when you give accurately, you get blessings from people's hearts. You know, when you give love, give respect, you get love, you get filled with respect. So if I'm giving from the wrong place, I feel drained, I feel empty, I feel tired, I feel worn out, fatigued. But if I really take from God, and you know, I really feel full. I can give and give and the beauty of life is giving and really the law of life says the more you give automatically you will receive the blessings from the hearts of people around you that is one of the sweetest things of life you know we have in Australia we have a retreat center outside Sydney and it's 132 acres and every weekend not during the lockdown we have 100 people come to learn meditation, live in. It's a beautiful place. It's in the World Heritage List um, of UNESCO. And the, the person who runs it, she's 80 years old, Sally. She's a great grandmother. She has five children, 13 grandchildren. She keeps giving, keeps giving, and people would come just to see her. They have so much love for her. And her life is full of the blessings from the hearts of thousands of people. It's a beautiful life. Yeah. Okay. The next one is, may I please ask, relationship is about two people. If on our part, we are genuine in our part and we do take responsibility for our actions, but the other person is, I will love you, but you do this my way or else. How do we deal with that kind of a situation? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I would say this is one of the biggest issues in life today. And it's what we call conditional love. I will love you, but you have to behave the way I like. And then I approve of you. And we feel sometimes we, we, it's a tricky situation, there's no doubt. But I find that when I have self-respect, when I have self-respect, I'm able to, you know, manage that situation. I can manage that situation. When I live according to my things and my self-respect, and I really feel that if you um, begin to 
say what you feel and say your own needs. It's okay. Because sometimes my own fear prevents me from doing that. And honestly, in relationships, sometimes we're so controlled by my fear. If I say this, what will I think? If I do this, so I just suppress, suppress, suppress myself. That makes it worse, I feel. And I feel that if you express yourself, even a different view, it should be done with love and respect. Often what happens is we build up, we build up so much, and when it comes out, explosion. <laughs> and we all know the effect of that. But if I can speak with love and respect, it helps. Now, um, being a ben uh, sorry, um, <coughs> Jabeen, would you be able just to wait a sec? My battery is getting low. I just have to put in my sure. battery. I'll sure. be just a sec. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> That's all right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for your patience. Okay. So we have another question. Do you have special recommendation for tips or techniques that help for bringing awareness into every moment of our life? Yes. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think that's really what spirituality is about and spirituality says to wake up early in the morning and sit in the awareness of who i am and in front of god and that's not where it stops often we meditate and then my mind just goes back to its old thinking but i prepare that throughout the day I'm going to maintain this awareness. And I know some people that even every hour they take one minute to check in, am I sustaining the awareness of who I am, the connection with God? You know, my, you know when you're in a high state and you feel good and your mood's good, your actions and reactions are positive. But when you feel low, your actions and reactions are negative. And I often say that meditation isn't just sitting. Meditation is for life. Meditation is for relationships. It's almost like you sit in the morning, you create a high awareness, and then that high awareness influences your relationships and thinking at each moment of the day. To me, it's like I love it because each day you have an aim to carry your awareness with you. Sometimes you fail. That's okay. Sometimes you do get a little bit upset. You do let things affect you. It happens to all of us, but it doesn't matter. We keep practicing. What I love about spirituality, it's different from religion. Religion's just a belief. Spirituality is a practice. I'm constantly learning about myself and improving myself. And actually that makes a really, I think, a beautiful life. Next question is, you mentioned about forming, storming, norming. If there is a lot of I and ego, then how do we achieve norming? <laughs> you know, I think that we may not say it, but often in my mind, we're correcting people constantly. I don't like the way you do this. I want you to do it this way, or sometimes even it comes out my mouth. Do it this way, do it that way. Now, with children, we have to give guidance. We do have to give them direction. That's the role of a parent. But as you all know, it's a different world in which we live today. There's a certain point where we have to trust that the children's childhood has laid a foundation of values. And even if they step over the line a little bit as a teenager, 
if we're always correcting them and disapproving of them and criticizing them, we don't realize that sometimes they move away a little bit, their hearts move away, or they're not honest with us. They feel I can't tell mom and dad what I'm really up to because they won't accept it. And therefore, I really do think that, you know, if we really give that, uh, accept them as they are, true love is to accept people. And today, it's a different world in which we live. And I honestly feel the greatest gift to people is to accept them. And you know what happens? If you really fully embrace people, even if they're different, very different, when they feel your, that love and trust from you, they will be open with you. They will tell you the truth. And so it's a subtle thing in your attitude, but if your attitude is always critical, it, you know, I often think, how can I measure my ego? How much do I know uh, what ego I have? I'd say it's mental criticism. Some people think because I'm soft and quiet, I don't have much ego. It's nothing to do with that. It's your state of mind. And if you're chronically critical in your mind of people around you, I would say that's a measure of how much ego I have. I've realized that if you want people to come close, give them love, give them respect, give them acceptance, they will come close, they will listen to you. You keep saying, do this, do this, do this, you push them away. And that's the way the world is. In the past generation, whatever mom and dad said, they just do. But it's different now. And we can't say, oh, you should be like my parents, like I was. You can't say that. It's a different world in which we live. <laughs> The next question is, I'm totally cut off from some very negative people in my life and I feel completely at peace. So am I right what I'm doing? You know, I think sometimes, you know, all everyone's um, situations are difficult, are different. Um, personally, I feel you feel deep down better if you can interact with all types of people. But I must be honest that sometimes there's some poor souls, and I'm saying that with love and respect, you just have to have mercy. They just get so negative. It's their reality. They've created this reality. They just see the world in such a negative state because their self-esteem is so low. And sometimes, quite honestly, they can be high achievers in life, they make a lot of money, they're well known, and yet they're completely negative. And I've seen a lot of people have the confidence to run businesses, run organizations, be successful outside. It doesn't mean they have self-esteem, not at all. And if they don't have self-esteem, they're just always negative. And they really believe my family's no good, my wife is no good, no one's any good. Unfortunately, there are people like this. And if you can't manage it, then sometimes you have to make some distance between you and them. But my experience is the more you become strong, the more you strengthen yourself, you can manage difficult people and negative people. And we all have to in life because as you know, you know, one in four human beings has mental health issues. And quite frankly, I think it's even more than that. We need a lot of mercy in life today. And how can I have it? I find that when you feel close to God, you actually, you can feel a lot of mercy inside the people around you. Because when people are chronically negative, they don't like themselves. I can guarantee they might be angry, but deep down, they think I'm not a nice person. And I've seen that if you hold, you know, if you hold good feelings for them, you can, it can have an influence on them. I can't guarantee that, but I've seen some people really change. <laughs> I think what you just said is relevant to the next question, but I shall just read it out anyway, in case you want to add something. You said you must let go. But when you know that the other person is wrong and continues to do wrong or behave inappropriately, 
How can we let go? Okay, what can you do? What can you do if they keep behaving wrongly? You know, I'm sure you've said to them, I don't agree with this behavior, but what can you do? And what happens is we disturb our mind. We become absolutely peaceless because of their behavior. And if you're living under the same roof, you've got to make a decision. Do I just make my mind chronically peaceless because of this person's behavior? Or do I actually become a little bit detached and decide, you know, each human soul has their own part. They're all playing their own part. And sometimes you have to be the observer of others' parts. There's not much you can do. And therefore, at least keep your mind healthy. And what I've seen, the more you remain healthy, it has an influence on them. And interestingly, the less you're affected by them, they begin to notice that. So when they have their moods, their tantrums, or they do things wrong, and you don't really buy into it, strangely, they see they're having less <clears throat> influence over you. You can begin to change them with that behavior. It's not easy. Because if I can say underneath all of these relationships are karmic accounts, we're born into families and there's karmic stories. We're often married. And when you marry, I often think it's like an iceberg, not that it's cold, <laughs> but you know, an iceberg is 10% above the water, 90% below. So what you see is the 10%. And often what you see with your eyes is attractive, you like it, but as you get to know people, their nature, their personality, the 90% that's hidden under the iceberg starts to emerge. And then we start to say, oh, I don't know whether I like this. You know, this is the nature of relationships. And this is where really, when I begin to understand more about myself, my own weaknesses, I begin to accept others and their weaknesses too. But in saying that, it's not easy when people are chronically negative. And, um, you know, these days, I don't know what you feel, but sometimes if people are like that, you know they're sad. And if they get some professional help, and that just means like counseling means talking to somebody that they can be open with. Often it's, it's not a shame and we should never say it's a shame. It's actually common sense because a, an, a third party they will listen to. They will often not listen to a family member. When a third party says, do you realize why you're unhappy? Do you realize why you're having conflict in your family? Then sometimes things begin to dawn on them and they begin to change a little bit, but not always, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> One more question, brother. I've been doing meditation for a few months, but still not able to control my sensitivity and reactions to others. Where and what is the lack in my meditation? You know, you know the human mind creates around 70,000 thoughts in a waking day. For your whole life, you've let them run anywhere. No control. And when you sit to meditate, it's then that you realize how little control or mastery you have over your thoughts. You have to be very patient, extremely patient with yourself. And the thing is never ever give up your meditation. But I'm just gonna just leave you with one small thing that I used to, you know, we talk about meditation, but often people think that meditation is <clears throat> hard work. You know, trying to coerce my thinking. In the Brahma Kumaris, we talk about remembrance. Because remembrance is the most natural thing for the human mind. At every second, we're remembering. So if you remember a loved one, three things happen. You remember, you connect. Secondly, your influence. Thirdly, you get a feeling inside. So if you remember someone you're really close to, you get that loving feeling, you're influenced by that. 
you feel good inside. If you remember someone you're in conflict with, the second you remember, you feel uncomfortable. You feel, and you download that discomfort in your mind. What we do here, we just remember God. And it's like I plug into a source that's absolutely pure, full of love, peace, purity, power, joy. And that's the influence on my mind. And if I really look at life, and if I'm not happy, the real question is, what am I remembering? We keep plugging my intellect into the past, plugging my intellect into relationships of conflict, and then I wonder why I'm unhappy. Here we learn to plug into the Supreme Soul and have that influence on my mind. That's what I've learned. And it's an unbelievable transformation. It's like, no matter what's going on in your life, you can go to that place and you can feel the influence of peace, love, belonging. It has an incredible influence on you and your relationships. Thank you, brother. That was amazing. Before we end this session, could you give us a little taste of what kind of meditation should we do or what kind of inner communication that we should do so that we have harmony in our relationships? Yes. So, um, so I'll, I'll share a little bit of meditation and then maybe we'll finish. So I'd just like to thank you been thank you so much for having me it's really been so lovely to be with you thank you <laughs> and thank it's you an everybody. Honor. it's an honor to have you brother charlie and maybe we will want more and i would like to request whoever is online today with us to give me a feedback and then we can arrange more sessions like this no problem thank you. so just a few moments let us sit still, not be distracted by my phone or my computer, not move around. And begin my journey to healthy relationships by building a healthy relationship with myself. Just visualize yourself as a tiny spark of life energy sitting in the center of the forehead in the front of the brain. And just feel yourself letting go all the labels of your body. Just feel yourself letting go, letting go, stepping back, withdrawing to a point in the center of your forehead. Just feel that I, the soul, sit in this forehead of this body. And in this state of self-awareness or soul consciousness, Look through the eye of your mind to the one relationship that's permanent. Just visualize the Supreme Soul, a radiant jewel of light, emanating vibrations of love. Just hold that image in your mind and feel this divine love, this pure love, entering the core of your being. Just feel like you're live streaming God's love into your heart, into yourself. There is no greater power than God's love. And this love, rebuilds my self-respect. And this love gives me the power 
to respect everyone, even those who don't respect me. We are now living in a very challenging time in the world. It's essential to rebuild my spiritual power. And that means that every day to build a structure into my life to sustain me spiritually. Every morning, wake up, sit down quietly and start to reflect on who I am and sit in front of the lover of the soul and allow yourself to be completely loved. Just observe how healthy you begin to feel and how you begin to treat everyone with love and respect. The more I do that, the more others will begin to treat me also with love and respect. So thank you again, Sabine and everybody. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Om Shanti. Om Shanti, Jalin. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Like I said earlier, I would appreciate if you could give me your feedback. If you would want more talks like this, then we can organize on any topic. If you have any topic in particular, please do let us know. Thank you very much. And uh, once again, I have posted the um, link of where this class has been saved on YouTube. So feel free to share it with your friends or if you want to rewatch, feel free. Please copy it before I end this meeting. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Bye.